transnational history. This is a recording what transnational history stands for. Transnational history, broadly defined, is a spectrum of methodological approaches that analyze encounters, transition, and exchanges of people and peoples, ideas, technologies, etc. across national borders. <clears throat> its focus is not on this or that nation, but on the processes that transpire between them and among them as a result of that process. Very often history is researched and then written within the confines of a sometimes broader national narrative. We find history written about slavery in the United States, industrial development in 19th century Great Britain, and the samurai and Japanese military identity during World War II, to name just a few very arbitrary examples. This can be done and can be very exciting. However, all the historical research projects mentioned above quite obviously have a relationship to something that is outside a specified nation. For example, um, when we look at slavery in the United States, Africa comes into play. What happens in Africa where the slaves come from? Uh, there is what you call the Black Atlantic, the Middle Passage, the process of taking slaves, putting them onto ships and transporting them to the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, involving many different nations. Uh, the Dutch, for example, uh, the, the British, uh, they're very much involved in that. It also involves the Caribbean. What happens in the Caribbean? That is where most of the slaves actually go, and even where the slaves go before they go to the United States. Also, abolition comes into play here in Great Britain and in France, not only in the United States. So there's always an outside connotation and connection, even when we talk about slavery in the United States in the 19th century. Or the other example, if we look at Great Britain and Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, well, there are other industrial revolutions and processes in nations such as France or Germany. There's competition between these nations. So looking at only the Industrial Revolution in Great Britain also encompasses always the outside. What is happening outside? <coughs> the industry in Great Britain um, has to use outside material, outside sources and resources, raw materials. The steel industry in Great Britain that fuels the Industrial Revolution depends on ore, iron ore, being transported across uh, the, the North Sea, for example. Other things come into play, for example, espionage, the knowledge of how to make things, how to make machines. It's other nations that want to know why Great Britain is so good and so very fast in its industrial revolution. It's always the outside that plays some kind of a role. <clears throat> when we look at Japanese, for example, there is a war with the United States. It's World War II. Uh, China and Indochina are coveted prizes for the aggressive military Japanese uh, expansion. The creation of a southeastern co-prosperity sphere is in the making. There's an axis, Berlin, Rome, and Tokyo. So there's always something that is outside, and that is what transnational history is interested in. The processes that are behind the keywords and connections I just had outlined are very rudimentary, but that is what transnational, is, transnational history is interested in. That does not mean that transnational history wants to supplant national history. On the contrary, it strives to enrich our understanding of what is happening and why it has happened by addressing a dimension that is often missing in a nationally based narrative. Slaves did not arrive in the United States from nowhere. Ores, iron ores needed to make, needed to make British steel came from across the North Sea, as I had said before, and the Japanese military increasingly resorted to their construction of a personal and national honor grounded in what they understood uh, the samurai stood for, not out of a fancy or simply an idea un unrelated to the world outside Japan. 
We too often assume that borders are a given, almost like natural occurrences, but borders as well as nations do not exist in isolation. Borders and nations can only be defined as separate from other nations, as something that is different from what is beyond an arbitrary line that denotes a border. Such lines, borders and differences change over time and what a nation is is thus a constructed identity or to use Benedict Arnold, it is an imagined community. Transnational history focuses uh, on these processes. It does not look at the process within the confines of a national border, but what penetrates a national border. And this it is quite different from a strict comparative history, where one development process topic that is researched and narrated within a national framework is being held against another similarly shaped narrative to analyze the differences and the reasons thereof. Transnational history also is different from regional history inasmuch as regions are mostly defined by geographically or economically. They may overlap nations, but they are rather spaces that in themselves are defined by a border, even if that is not a political border. Regions also denote a geographic proximity that is not a necessary prerequisite for a transnational approach. Nations, even before the advent of the modern nation state at the end of the 19th, 18th century, are defined by culture and politics, and they do not necessarily have to have well-defined borders. This, I have to admit, is not as clear-cut as it may sound. We do not have a clearly defined notion of what a nation actually is, and if the term nation does apply only uh, to the modern nation state and not also to, for example, Native Americans or First Nations that perceive themselves as nations, were called nations by their compatriots and were treated as such by British, Canadian and Amer American authority. What has become clear, I hope, is that transnational history has a very high potential to shed light on historical processes and phenomena and developments in its own right but also as a tool to create a more comprehensive picture of national processes and developments that when, analy when we analyze them solely within the confines of a national border. Transnational history is not the study of the impact of an outside force, but rather of what happens that makes that force and that impact possible. If we look, for example, at ideas, transnational history, would research the discourse about these ideas in various nations by non-state actors, how the idea is transferred from one nation to the other, and what happens to the idea during that transfer. In addition, it would look at how the ideas were perceived by the receiving societies, which in turn may shape their response to those nations or non-state actors that are perceived as the, as the originators of that idea. Um, examples could be uh, anything actually, but if we take one example, the settle settlement house movement during the progressive era in the United States, there seem to be similar developments in the United States and Great Britain. Settlement houses existed in Chicago, in New York, but also in London. One person that is always mentioned in the context of American history is James Adams, who established the first settlement house in Chicago. What we have to take into account, actually, when we write the history of settlement housing in the United States is that Jane Addams went to Europe before she actually had the idea of creating a settlement house. Um, she traveled to London and met people who were connected to Toynbee Hall, the first settlement house in London. She took that idea and transplanted it, transferred it to the United States and created the, their own, uh, her own settlement house while at the same time other people, mostly at women colleges, had the same idea of transplanting settlement house approaches to studying uh, people within, um, um, within the cities uh, from London to New York and to Boston and so forth.
So we have a process that shapes the idea during its transfer, its application in another country. And then again, we will have to look, if we take a transnational approach, of what happens then in London. Do they look across the Atlantic Ocean at Chicago, at New York, and the settlement houses there to find out what do they do? How do they fare? How do they get along? What could we learn from what they are doing? So it is a discourse that is constantly shaping and reshaping an idea. It is not a unilateral approach where one thing is taking from Great Britain to the United States and that's it. It goes back and forth a number of times and that is the process that transnational history is interested in. The history of women's movement also can gain a valuable insights by looking at the transatlantic transfer of ideas, uh, particularly between Great Britain, France and the United States, for example. Uh, one example would be the writings of Mary Wollstonecraft, who wrote an important book. Um, we could do a comparative history of how that book was perceived and uh, actually read in the United States, Great Britain and in France, but we could also look at who took that book, that idea, from Great Britain to the United States or to France, what ideas originated in France and Great Britain and helped shape the perception of Mary Wollstonecraft's book in Great Britain and in France and in the United States. Transnational history would help to analyze what led to her being read outside of Great Britain in the first place, what agency was involved in that transfer, and what shaped the exchanges of ideas. Another example might be the missionaries, Jesuits for example. They did not only take a religion, the Roman Catholic religion, to foreign countries to convert uh, the heathens. They also took with them their ideas of social order, gender roles, political institutions, the place of religion within social and political systems. And their experience, uh, written down through the revelations then published in Paris, for example, received a widespread readership. It's still the hunger for exotic um, ideas and exotic uh, happenings, and it led to financial support, recruitment for missionaries, and so forth. The construction of race, whiteness, and gender had reper repercussions in France and in the European context overall. So we have that too. Migration is another topic that transnational history uh, might, it, it, not might, but is actually studying. The movement of peoples. They may become part of a dominant society through acculturation and assimilation. They may become a diaspora uh, that connects and alters two nations through these intermediaries. Uh, migrants may become sojourners who are marginalized or marginalized themselves. So there's a lot of things going on, but what, hap what clearly is the case is that there's more to migration than just a person moving from one place to another and simply becoming part of the receiving society. There is a constant discourse across national borders that transnational history is studying. Transnational history can learn much in this respect from borderland studies that focuses on the in-between, the variable intellectual space that is permeable and where osmotic processes can be studied. All in all, transnational history I believe is an exciting new approach to better understand historical processes. Thank you.